Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this second lecture on citizenship. In the previous lecture we have discussed uh, the idea of citizenship and how it is about a relationship between the ruling class with the um, ruled. So uh, citizenship denotes a kind of relationship that individual shares with the state or the authority of the state and how this idea evolved from Greek. Um, Roman uh, times to modern 19th and 20th century, we have discussed and also we have discussed the civic republicanism and the uh, liberal conception of citizenship in the previous lecture and what was the difference between the single and the dual citizenship. In today's lecture, we will focus particularly on the T.H. Marshall uh, conception of uh, citizenship and its critique particularly by the Marxist and the feminist critique. So, uh, T. H. Marshall conception of citizenship is regarded as the most comprehensive account of citizenship and there is a kind of evolutionary understanding of uh, modern uh, citizenship in theorization of T. H. Marshall. So, he also explains uh, or uh, articulates his theory of uh, citizenship by historicizing the uh, political or the social and the economic transformation that was taking place particularly in England in the modern times. And by historicizing it, he also included new rights and those who were excluded from the uh, domains of citizenship and argued that citizenship is more about progressive extension of equality to those who were excluded from the ambit of citizenship. So, this we will discuss in uh, today's lecture. So, this conception of T. H. Marshall um, on citizenship is as I said the most comprehensive account of citizenship in modern times and his theorization of citizenship is based on this uh, his study of historical evolution of different classes in the society. So, the uh, relationship that uh, Marcel argue is about how different classes in the society relate to the state or the administration of the state and these classes over a period of time did play a significant role in the political and economic transformation in the society and citizenship as an ideal help us to understand or uh, not just uh, those transformation but also how the changing uh, nature of that relationship between the social classes and the state uh, unfolded over a period of time. So, his theorization of citizenship is based on his study of historical evolution of different uh, classes with the growth of capitalism in England and their corresponding demands and claims and rights to the state. So, the different classes, so uh, first emerge a mercantile capitalist, followed by the middle class and then by the marginalized poor or workers. So, their uh, demands from the state lead to different uh, nature, different uh, forms or a structure of a state in say modern England. So, initially there is a kind of adjudicatory role of a state. So, a state is there to play a kind of arbitrary ro role uh, and have a very minimum involvement in the uh, functioning of individuals or the pursuit of wealth or happiness by the individual. So, state has a very minimum role to arbitrate if there is some violation of contract and things like that. Then it is followed that the parliamentary democracy or with the rise of representative forms of government, people themselves began to articulate, discuss and deliberate on the issues 
concerning the common affair of the society. And finally, you see the demand for a kind of welfare state where some essential uh, services is supposed to be provided by the state. So, these historical evolution of different classes leads to different claims, different kind of demands to the, uh, to the states and Marshall tries to understand this relationship between individual and the state in this historical evolution of different classes and their corresponding demands to the state. So, uh, basically T. H. Marshall was a liberal social democrat and in his influential account of the growth of citizenship in England, he argues that the concept of citizenship has developed in conflict as well as in collusion with capitalism. So, the feature of uh, Marshall, one of the key feature of T. H. Marshall conceptualization of citizenship is to see how the modern notion of citizenship uh, has evolved in its conflict, but also in its collusion with the uh, modern capitalism. So, uh, the outcome of the citizenship and capitalism is very contradictory to each other. So, where capitalism produce inequalities in society, citizenship is about creating a horizontal solidarity that means extending the domain of equality which treats everyone equally. So, the outcome of the citizenship or the objective of the citizenship is to create a society of free and equal members. So, the equality is the uh, intended objective of unfolding or evolution of citizenship in modern times, whereas capitalism inherently lead to social equalities or economic inequalities and how the both conflict and collude together is something which T. H. Marshall defines. So, he links citizenship to social classes and envision citizenship as a remedies to the inequalities produced by capitalist market economy. So, uh, citizenship for Marshall is a kind of remedies to uh, the social inequalities or economic inequalities that is produced by modern uh, capitalist market economy. So, for Marshall, the concept of citizenship is rooted in the ideal of universal equality among the members of a political community. So, within a political community, so in modern times, uh, the political community is also understood as nation state. So, the member of nation states therefore, they share a kind of uniform or equal status in the eyes of state without any discrimination on the basis of caste, class, gender, race, religion, etcetera. So, um, uh, his conception of citizenship is based or rooted in this ideal of universal equality among those who are the members of a particular political community like nation state. So, this notion of citizenship is also known as the liberal theory of citizenship where the civil right which is necessary for the growth or the uh, living a dignified life for the individual is the very foundation of the citizenship. So, the ideal of citizenship is to ensure that the individual carry certain rights which must be protected by the state and those rights are necessary for the fuller development or the uh, complete development or development of his talents or skills is absolutely necessary and a state must uh, protect those uh, civil rights. So, in this liberal theory of citizenship, civil rights constitute the very foundation it believes in the evolution of rights associated with the citizenship and can also be described as the evolutionary theory of citizenship. So, that means, Marshalls like liberals argue that civil rights is absolutely necessary in any conception of uh, citizenship because it is about the individual rights which is necessary for his full growth or full development and a state must protect them. But then Marshall also argue about other kind of rights which is uh, something that evolved over a period of time with the change in the political structure and the rise of different social classes in the society. So, in that sense in Marshall what we find is not a rigid or a fixed understanding of citizenship, but a kind of evolutionary theory where it argued that citizenship gradually unfold or internalize those who are excluded from its domain. So, uh, it starts with the civil rights and we will discuss how it also includes the political rights and finally, the social economic rights. 
So, uh, Marshall theory of citizenship, which is a liberal theory of citizenship, can also be regarded therefore as a kind of evolutionary theory of citizenship, which includes newer rights or newer people in the domain of citizenship understood as the uh, extension of equality among the members of a particular political community. So, and this definition of Marshall theory of citizenship which we have discussed in the previous class is it the free and the equal member of a political community. So, he defines a citizenship is as those member who are the free and equal member of a political community. So, that is the understanding or the definition of citizenship in T. H. Marshall where the member of a particular political community is free that means without any coercion, without any uh, suppression by the others or by the state or equal. So, without any kind of scriptive of hi or hierarchical status every single member of the state are treated equally. So, that is the definition of citizenship in T. H. Marshall and this definition of uh, citizenship is widely accepted definition of citizenship in modern democracy. So, all the modern state or democratic state recognize the individual as equal member. So, the equality before the law or equal protection of law or right to vote and understanding of that right to vote as one person, one vote, one vote, one value is rooted in this idea of equality where the citizens or all the citizens of a country or a political community is treated equally without any discrimination on the basis of caste, class, region, language, uh, education, uh, literacy, so on and so forth. So, this definition of T. H. Marshall uh, is widely uh, accepted uh, definition of citizenship in modern democracy. It basically argues that citizenship is about a process of progressively expanding the domain of equality. So, it may start with the few people, but it is something which includes those who are excluded. So, it is a kind of continuous evolutionary thing. So, uh, when we uh, in modern times talks about the political uh, debates and discussions around the citizenship and we say for instance in India talk about citizenship as it is defined in the constitution. So, the legal and the constitutional understanding of citizenship. So, that is one, but then there is a kind of gradual development socio-economic and political which requires new kind of articulation or inclusion of newer groups which were excluded from the domains of citizenship. So, and the citizenship uh, in uh, similarly as we see in the uh, Marshall's understanding of the historical evolution of citizenship in England is a kind of progressive expanding the domain of equality among different social classes. So, all the classes and historically if you see for instance the political rights as the key uh, feature of modern citizenship was not available to everyone to begin with. So, uh, in the beginning it was uh, limited to the male member even among the male it was limited to say uh, the property or the educated male members and then finally, it was extended to the women to every uh, man and the idea of universal suffrage. So, anyone um, uh, with a particular age has the right to vote that ensures his or her participation in the political process. Now, this is a long evolution of including everyone, the universal suffrage is a kind of evolution of uh, a limited franchise to uh, a kind of universal. Every adult member in the political community having right to vote is something which signifies, which uh, represents this uh, evolution or the expansion of uh, this idea of equality. So, in other domains also similarly, it is not just about right to vote, but the citizenship is uh, understood as a process which progressively expand the domain of equality among different uh, classes, different social classes. In his classic, The Citizenship and the Social Class, 1950, Marshall distinguishes three strands or uh, bundles of rights that constitute uh, citizenship. And that is also to do with the historical evolution of different social classes and their corresponding demands. And these three uh, bundle of rights or set of rights are 
civil rights, political rights and socio-economic rights and we will discuss these three rights one by one. So, to begin with the civil rights which is regarded as absolutely necessary for the individual growth and freedom. So, it is absolutely necessary and these civil rights are freedom of speech and expression, movement, equality before the law or equal protection of law or right to own property. So, uh, these rights are the civil rights which is regarded as the absolutely necessary for the growth and the progress of individual and with the growth and progress of individual it is understood that uh, it automatically lead to the progress of the society or the economy or the nation as such. So, um, these rights are uh, individual rights which a state must protect and therefore, these rights are also negative rights as it limits or checks the authority of the state. So, a state must not interfere or take away those rights of the individual which is absolutely necessary for his or her progress. So, that is the one very uh, significant or the crucial aspect of citizenship which includes the civil rights that is those rights of individual which must be protected by the state. In other words, it is understood as negative rights as it put limits or it is a kind of check to the authority or the power of the state. Then comes the political rights which is uh, about providing the individual with the opportunity to participate in the political life. So, the state has a very minimal uh, role in this and a state is something as sitting over the uh, citizens and the citizenship is a more kind of thin or a passive citizenship as a legal or constitutional status. So, a individual as a citizen being the member of a political community has certain rights and a state has the obligation or the responsibility to protect those rights. So, those are very passive thin notion of citizenship where it is about certain rights which is protected by the states. Then is the political rights which talks about a kind of civic republicanism where there is the opportunity of the citizen to not just have the rights guaranteed or protected by the states, but also they participate in the political process or the political life of the community. And those rights are say right to vote, right to contest election or to hold public office. So, these right to vote are gradually open not just to the few uh, selected uh, groups in the society, but all the members who are the citizens of uh, that political community or that uh, nation state. So, all the members have these political rights to vote, to fight election, to hold public offices and that ensure political participation or popular participation in the uh, political uh, process in a political community or in a state. So, this is the next stage of rights or next set of rights which much beyond the uh, very limited or the thin or passive notion of uh, citizenship as seen in terms of merely about the civil rights. So, political rights is extension to that uh, minimal or the uh, thin notion of citizenship to include a kind of active participation in the political life of the nation. Now, the third kind of rights are the socio-economic rights and these rights are about ensuring the basic social and economic needs of each individuals and this comes much later. So, this you can say the first stage of rights, second stage of rights and then the third stage of rights is the socio-economic rights which uh, talks about basically to ensure that every individual should have a certain basic minimum social and economic status which will ensure them to participate in the political life and also to lead a, uh, a dignified life or to lead a respected uh, life and to develop himself or herself in a free manner or with the equal opportunity and so on. So, in the absence of socio-economic rights, it was understood that uh, the legal or the political rights will have very little meaning or no meaning at all because then they will be open to certain manipulation and so on. So, the fulfillment of these uh, social economic rights say right to food, right to shelter, right to education, right to health and so on is regarded as the necessary for the individual 
to exercise their civil and political rights. So, in the sense, so for a very long time, the idea is that the state must recognize certain civil rights of the uh, people, then comes the political rights. People have not just certain rights, but they also have the right to participate in the decision making or in the political process. And finally, there was the argument that without the socio-economic rights, that means certain basic needs are available to all the citizens, the political and the civil rights will have very little uh, meaning or no meaning at all. So, to exercise uh, the civil and political rights meaningfully, it was absolutely necessary to provide certain socio-economic rights to the individual. Now, these rights in comparison to civil rights are positive rights as it requires or it is the responsibility of the state to provide certain basic services like education, health, uh, food and so on to the individuals particularly from the socio-economic disadvantaged groups. So, these socio-economic rights enables the state to perform certain duties. So, in other words, the socio-economic rights as positive rights require the state to perform certain duty in contrast to the civil rights which prevents the state from doing something. That means, a state cannot take away uh, the individual's right to uh, think, uh, express freely, to come together, to form association and so on, because those are uh, regarded as necessary for the development of the individual and a state must refrain from interfering or taking away those rights of the individual. So, uh, civil rights as negative rights limit the exercise of power by the state, but socio-economic rights enables or requires the state to perform certain duties, to provide certain uh, services, particularly for example, education, health, food, shelter and so on. So, it enables the state to provide certain basic uh, services to the individuals, particularly from the socio-economic disadvantaged groups. Now, these rights historically speaking according to Marshall correspond to three distinct centuries and he uh, argued that civil rights was demanded and argued about in 18th century, political rights in 19th century and socio-economic rights in the 20th century. So, this is not a kind of compartmentalization, but the broadly speaking these three kind of rights correspond to three uh, uh, centuries where in the 18th century, the uh, natural right theorist or the social contract theorist, they argued about those uh, civil rights of the individual, right to life, uh, property, uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech and expression, liberty of thought and so on. The political rights or representative forms of government or democracy is something which was broadly argued in the 19th century and the socio-economic rights are something which emerged in the 20th century. So, these cannot be said that civil rights was not argued in 19th or 20th century. In many countries, even in 21st century, there are a struggle going on for the civil political rights. But uh, theoretically speaking, in the historical sense, the way uh, these rights were argued and put forth in the modern times corresponded broadly to these three centuries of 18th, 19th, 20th respectively about civil, political and socio-economic rights. Further, you can also see a kind of correlation between the, the nature or the uh, characteristic of a state structure that emerged in these three centuries. So, in the first century, the judicial power of the state or the adjudicating role of the state or the judiciary has the main uh, defining uh, characteristic of the state. So, a state has the role to adjudicate to arbitrate between two uh, parties or more than two parties if there is some kind of violation or some transgression of rule or so on. So, to maintain law and order and to ensure that contract is followed was the uh, limited role of the state. So, the minimal role of the state had a very adjudicating role or its role and responsibility was limited to the adjudication. So, the nature of the state was more a kind of adjudicating or the judiciary or the judicial power. The next phase of uh, modern state uh, is about the parliamentary form of democracy where people themselves through their vote elect their representative and their representative takes a decision collectively on their behalf for the benefit of uh, common people or for the interest of the nation. 
So the parliamentary form of democracy is the result or the corresponding development in the state structure with the political rights. And finally, the um, socio-economic rights lead to creation or uh, formation of a welfare state where a state provides certain uh, services like education, healthcare, so on and so forth. So these are the corresponding development in the nature or the structure of uh, uh, the modern state which uh, uh, is corresponding to the uh, three stages of uh, rights, civil, political and socio-economic. So, what we find in um, uh, Marshall's conceptualization of citizenship is the two fundamental premise and these premise are a horizontal equality or a horizontal solidarity among all the members of the political community and this is radically different from the hierarchical or the vertical uh, status of individual in the society that existed in the pre-modern uh, feudal state or in the monarchy or in uh, the kingdom or dynasty. So, uh, the modern notion of citizenship is a radical departure from the hierarchical status of individual in the societies or groups in the society. So, it talks about the individual which is put in a condition of horizontal equality where everyone is treated equally. So, that is the one fundamental uh, premise of Marshall's conceptualization of citizenship which talks about horizontal equality or solidarity and b a gradual integration of various excluded and marginalized sections of the population into the fold of expanding circle of citizenship. So, the women, uh, the slaves, uh, the immigrants, uh, the racial or linguistic or religious minorities and so on is a kind of continuous uh, integration or inclusion in the folds of citizenship. So, for Marshall, the citizenship is therefore a kind of progressively expansion of this horizontal solidarity which includes those who were excluded from the domain of uh, citizenship. So, according to the Marshall, citizenship promotes equality of status of each individual and it ultimately combats this disruptive inequalities produced by the market economy. So, as I begin this lecture with this understanding that uh, in Marshall you also find that how the citizenship as an ideal which promotes equality confront or uh, also uh, collide or collude with the uh, modern uh, capitalism which produce social inequalities and uh, that is very uh, crucial in understanding. Uh, development or the growth of modern citizenship which is a kind of constant inclusion of those who are excluded, those who are marginalized or oppressed by the uh, uh, system of economic uh, growth and development. So, for uh, Marshall then uh, this uh, uh, idea of citizenship which promotes equality of status and that combats the disruptive inequalities of uh, market economy produce a new social or new national identity which creates a bond among the uh, members of the political community which uh, then move beyond their ascriptive or hierarchical identity or sense of being to a kind of horizontal comradeship or the solidarity where everyone treats the other as uh, same or equal to oneself. So, citizenship in modern world creates a national identity or consciousness where every uh, single member of a particular political community treats other as equal to itself uh, or himself or herself. So, his conception of citizenship is therefore premised upon the idea of making any hierarchical or ascriptive inequalities be it based on caste, culture, gender or ethnicity irrelevant in the eyes of a state. So, any kind of hierarchical or descriptive identity be it in the form of caste, class, gender, language, religion, race, so on and so forth irrelevant in the eyes of a state. In other words, in the eyes of a state all the, its citizens appear same and equal subjected to uniform set of rules 
and procedures without any discrimination on the basis of race, caste, gender, religion and language. So, that means in this formulation, we have a state which treats all its member as equal or same to each other without any discrimination. So, they are subjected to the same set of uniform rules without any discrimination on the basis of their ascriptive identities be it caste, class, gender, language. So, so Marshall argue about a liberal uh, democratic conception of citizenship which is about promoting equality or countering the social or economic inequalities that is produced by modern capitalism. So, this is the uh, T H Marshall uh, conceptualization of citizenship which is the liberal uh, conception of citizenship and there is certain um, uh, achievement and also limits to this liberal conception of citizenship which we will discuss in the following slides. And then finally, we will discuss the Marxist and the feminist critique of this uh, liberal conceptualization of citizenship. So, the uh, main achievement of the liberal uh, citizenship is that it holds out the promise of including individuals irrespective of their caste, class, gender, race in the ambit of citizenship. So, the fundamental premise of modern liberal notion of citizenship is it treats individual equally without any discrimination or it holds the promise of extension of such equality to the every member of society without any discrimination on the basis of their social, economic uh, and cultural backgrounds. However, uh, one major criticism against the liberal conceptualization of uh, citizenship is that it disregards the real differential situations of individuals in the societies across the classes which actually determines their ability to exercise the rights or legal capacities conferred on them by the virtue of their citizenship to a particular nation state. Now, uh, this is the major criticism against the liberal conceptualization of citizenship which uh, overlook or which uh, disregard the real socio-economic or the cultural status of the individual. And this point we will discuss when we will discuss differentiated or the multicultural citizenship in the next lecture. But here this point we need to take into account that the individual and his or her ability to participate or to exercise his or her civil rights require a certain degree of uh, social or economic status or the cultural status. So, if someone is in the minority community or someone is the majority community their opportunity or prospect to participate in the larger public domain is very different. However, in the liberal conceptualization such a uh, specific or actual real uh, situation of the individual is disregarded because everyone is treated in this neutral understanding of state and its uh, authority as same and equal it does not take into the consideration the different status of individual in the society which actually determines how they are able to exercise their political, civil and socio-economic uh, rights in the society. But liberal notion of citizenship is completely undermining or uh, ignoring these real differential status of the society. So, and that remains one of the major criticism against uh, the neutral or universal idea of citizenship in liberalism. So, Marshall himself had pointed out that this contradiction where uh, there is a acknowledgement of equality in the eyes of law politically, but the actual existence of a hierarchy or differential status of the individual in the society is a contradiction. So, the actual living reality of individual is that of hierarchical, but in the abstract or uh, legal political sense all of them are treated equally and that creates a contradiction of in the modern life. And uh, Marshall himself have pointed out uh, uh, this contradiction and its potential for the conflict in future. So, the major struggle in most of the modern democracy is about um, ensuring that uh, equality just not get limited merely to the legal and the political rights of the individual, but it also extends and includes 
the socio-economic uh, equality which is the real, uh, real equality. So, in India for example, B. R. Ambedkar, the idea of life of contradiction where legally and politically in post-independent India, every Indians are uh, one with one vote and one value. But in the social economic uh, life that determines their political rights or the political participation, they will remain uh, unequal or they will be treated unequal. How long that contradiction will emerge? So, similarly, Marcel did also argue about the potential of uh, this contradiction that may lead to conflict in the future. And therefore, he argued that citizen having equal social worth is as important and not merely of equal rights. And that requires equality of status in the form of a minimum supply of certain essential goods and services which should be guaranteed to each members of the political community. So, the equal social status is as important as the equal rights and that requires certain social uh, or essential goods and services made available to every member of the political community. John Rawls extended this argument in his uh, theory of justice or also in the political liberalism, where he talks about how to reconcile the contradiction of equality or equality of opportunity with the difference which is required to ensure that the least advantage or the disadvantage section also have the opportunity to um, uh, prosper, to uh, develop. So, in his a theory of justice and political liberalism, he tried to address this contradiction in the liberal notion of citizenship and his two principle or two theory of justice provide the framework within which a liberal democratic citizenship could unfold a fully adequate system of equal rights and liberties and equal opportunity combined with justice as fairness. So, this conception of justice we have discussed, but very briefly how the liberal democracy should combine with this equality of opportunity on the one hand and to ensure the participation of least advantage or disadvantage groups in the life of the nation on the other in his uh, uh, two principle of justice. So, uh, this uh, scheme would accept social and economic inequalities if such inequalities exist for the greatest benefit of the least advantage members of the society. So, John Rawls provide a kind of legal uh, framework through which the uh, social and economic injustices or disadvantage can be addressed within the liberal democracy. So, critiques of liberal uh, citizenship including those on the left, the feminist and the communitarians among others have also pointed out to the existing contradiction and ambivalences that are rooted in the liberal conception of citizenship and its relationship with capitalism. Particularly in this uh, second part of the lecture, we will focus on the Marxist and the uh, feminist critique of uh, a liberal conception of citizenship and how they address to the inherent contradiction in the liberal conceptualization of citizenship. So, let us begin with the Marx uh, understanding. So, Marx argued that the claims of liberal citizenship about equality and freedom are flawed as these are incompatible with capitalism. So, on the one hand liberal democracy promises equality and freedom and on the other hand in economic uh, sphere it promotes capitalism. And this idea of true equality and freedom is something which is incompatible with uh, capitalism. And for him the modern state is a state which protects the interest of those who own the property or the bourgeois and therefore, he characterizes the modern state as the bourgeois state. And that bourgeois state is incapable of delivering the promises of equal citizenship as it is claimed. So, according to Marx, equal right in a capitalist society is mainly a bourgeois right. So, who get the exercise of civil and political rights? Those who have the property, but the majority of people who do not have the property are uh, remain more or less same condition of subordination or suppression by the small minority which he calls uh, bourgeoisie which controls the property and thereby the institution of the state. In his work on the Jewish question, he distinguishes the rights of men from the rights of citizen. And he basically criticized the rights of men 
which uh, is based on the natural right theory which he regards as the extension of uh, modern egoistic bourgeois self. So, Marx rejects the rights of men like freedom of religion, liberty, security and private property because he believed that these rights cannot reconcile with ideals of community lives and these rights are basically recognized for the egoistic bourgeois self for his self atomistic uh, progress or development. So, this according to Marx is contrary to the human sociality, the community life or the very nature of human species which requires him or her to participate in the life of community and not to lead a life of isolated atomistic egoistic self as in the bourgeois market economy. So, this according to Marx is contrary to the human sociality or the very nature of human species and therefore, Marx was supportive of citizens or political rights or uh, rights of citizen rather than rights of man in terms of as it allow some kind of restriction to the power of the state and also provides the individual as citizen to participate or uh, do collectively help in the uh, formation of new collectivities or uh, uh, collective actions for the life of the community or life uh, in the polity or the uh, uh, life in the state. So, uh, for Marx uh, the rights of citizen is more uh, important uh, and uh, valid than the right of man which he regarded as merely about recognition of bourgeois atomistic self uh, which is uh, contrary to the human nature or the nature of the human species which is about sociality participating in the life of community and citizenship should be about a life in the community uh, life or participation in the community life which leads to the restriction of the state and also some kind of collective action which uh, defines the human species. So, that is uh, the Marxist criticism which regards the liberal conception as merely bourgeois conception of citizenship. Feminism on the other hand argued about the liberal ideas of citizenship which uh, they argue is based on argue about the uniformity or equality are actually inimical to the rights of the women and they are critical of uh, such notion of citizenship on following two grounds. First, citizenship is gender blind that means, the liberal uh, notion of citizenship argue that it does not discriminate among the individual on the grounds of his or her sex, gender, caste, class etcetera. So, the identity of the individual, the descriptive identity of the individual does not really matter in the eyes of a state. So, a state treats everyone equally without any consideration of his or her social, economic, gender or class uh, caste background. So, this um, uh, gender blindness of the citizenship in liberal democracy fails to understand the structure of operations and suppressions that exist in patriarchy. So, uh, one of the ground of feminist criticism to the liberal notion of citizenship is that this notion of citizenship is gender blind and thereby it does not recognize the structure of patriarchy that exists in modern society which prevent the women to participate in the public life of the state as free and equal members. So, what prevent the women even when a state is neutral or gender blind is the system of patriarchy and precisely because of the gender blindness of the liberal notion of citizenship, they do not recognize the structure which prevents the women to take participation in the public life as a free and equal member and that is the one uh, ground of criticism to liberal notion of citizenship. The second, the discursive practices of citizenship have produced a dichotomy between private and public life. So, the modern liberal democracy is based on this well established argument about division of sphere of life into private and public and private is domestic life hence outside the purview of the state and public life is about the collective life where the state and civil society they all should come together to discuss about the collective affairs of the community, but private sphere or the private domain or the domain of domestic life state must not interfere. So, uh, this uh, dichotomy of private and public where 
the space for citizenship became increasingly identified with the male and public activity. So, the sphere of male is in the public and therefore, the citizenship has the attributes or characteristic that reflect the male characteristics or the public life. Whereas, the private or the domestic life is the life of women and women should have a limited role in the private life of the citizen and uh, their participation in the public life was neither desirable nor promoted. So, while the public private distinction was essential for the assertion of the liberal notion of citizens as the autonomous individual, self defining autonomous individual, it also leads to identification of private with the domestic which has played an important role in the exclusion and subordination of women and liberal notion of citizenship again fails to recognize this exclusion even when they claim to be neutral, universal or, or free from any kind of social, economic, uh, cultural biases. So, feminists of different strands criticize the liberal notion of citizenship on these two grounds where one is about the gender blindness and the second is this dichotomy between private and public which uh, uh, prevents the women to participate in the public life. It is exclusionary for the women. So, uh, the feminist questions the neutrality and uh, generality of the citizenship and within feminism we have the different approaches to the citizenship. One strands of a feminist argued about more and more participation or representation of women in the public political sphere. So, uh, demand for equal rights or equal pay for equal work, equal wages and uh, equal legal rights and so on uh, having representation of women in the public life is a reflection of this one strand of feminism which argued about more and more visibility or the representation of women in the public life. The second strands of uh, feminism radically alter these premises and bring about new articulation of citizenship altogether. So, it questions the patriarchal notion of uh, state and citizenship and also it questions the public private divide by asserting that personal is also political. So, in this liberal dichotomy of public and private the domain of political is always the domain of public. Now, a group of feminists which we call radical feminist also questions this liberal uh, dichotomy of private and public by asserting that what happens within the space of domesticity or life of the family is also the political. What happens with the human uh, the body of women is also a political question. So, this assertion of personal is political led to radical articulation or re-articulation of state, society and citizenship and many scholars like Carol uh, Gilligan, Sarah uh, Rudick and many others have argued about altering the public spaces and structure of the state through the notions like ethics, care, compassion and so on. So, they radically tries to make uh, the uh, modern state gender just not just by permitting or allowing the women to participate in the public life on male terms, but actually altering the male attributes of the public spaces, where the space for ethics, care, compassion uh, will change the whole uh, discourse or discursive terrain of public life. So, that is the attempt of the feminism to not just be equal participant in the public life, but also change on the uh, terms of discourse or the attributes of public uh, political life and ultimately the life of state, society and citizenship. So, that is the feminist contribution or criticism to the liberal uh, notion of citizenship and with that we end this lecture and you can follow some of this literature. Once again, the Anupama Roy Citizenship in Rajiv Bhargav and Acharya is a very good uh, chapter which you, you should look at and you can also refer to some of these other literature to understand some of the themes that we have discussed in this lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to discuss the differentiated or the multicultural citizenship and also the cosmopolitan citizenship. So, um, that is all uh, in this lecture. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you all.